what's going on you rogues rebels and renegades welcome to episode 61 of the rogue country podcast how are you i hope you're doing well i hope you're keeping well and i hope you're listening to new music today we are brought to you by pick print screen printing that's p-i-c pick print screen printing an independent liverpool based family run hand screen printing company we use them for all our t-shirt printing for all the rogue merch you see they do the mugs they do the t-shirts they do my t-shirts they do josh bettis's t-shirts they print band merch workwear business uniforms and they even print club and sports team wear and apparel lines whatever you need print screen printing for pick print screen printing is the ones to go to go over to their instagram at pick underscore print underscore screen underscore printing follow them on facebook email them at pick print screen printing at gmail.com tell them the rogues send you and they will hook you up i have used these guys for over six years now i would not use anyone else i can't recommend them enough and if you're a musician if you're an artist if you're a band if you're a sports team whatever you're doing if you need merch printing paul at pick print screen printing is your guy before we get into some tour announcement i want to give a shout out to john craig if you're listening today thank you so much for your message john didn't know american aquarium were touring listened to our podcast found out they were touring and they were playing manchester and bought tickets that means the fucking world to me john thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for supporting live music i'm glad putting these tour dates we're not getting sponsored by them we're not asking for promotion i just believe these tours are amazing and you should go check them out and yeah let's get into it up first starting this week you're listening to this on the 6th of february on monday american aquarium are coming over this week starting february 9th and thursday they're in london on the 10th they're in manchester on the 11th they're in glasgow and on the 12th they're in leeds you do not want to miss these american aquarium from february 9th to february 12th are playing london manchester glasgow and leeds i've bought a ticket john craig's bought a ticket and now you need to buy a ticket after that We've got John R. Miller and J.P. Harris coming over in March. So on March 9th in Glasgow, March 10th in Newcastle upon Tyne, March 11th in Manchester, March 12th in Nottingham, and March 14th in London. These guys are phenomenal songwriters. If you've not listened to John R. Miller or J.P. Harris, get to know and then buy your tickets. You've got a month to learn those lyrics. After that in April, we've got Mike and the Moon Pies coming over. The UK really is lucky when it comes to country music right now and you do not want to miss any of these tours. Mike and the Moon Pies kick off things on the 1st of April at Newcastle upon Tyne. Then they're in London on the 2nd of April. They're in Nottingham on the 3rd of April. 4th of April, they're in Manchester and I'm opening for them. It's going to be insane. And on the 5th of April, they're playing in Oxford. And I know the great Ags Connolly is opening for them there. So you do not want to miss this tour. There are going to be other country artists playing in the UK this year. And I'll do my best to tell you about them. If you're touring, if you're a musician or an artist or a band and are playing some country gigs here in the UK, drop me a line. I will include you in all of this. And thank you so much for listening. Make sure you get your tickets and let's get on to today's show. Oh, today we have my crooked teeth and just a bit of spoilers before this episode i nearly went an hour without asking him why he was called my crooked teeth jake alahowski is an oxfordshire based musician he's in the americana realm he's in the country realm and his latest single you're gonna break my heart he recently released plants his feet firmly in the country realm we get into what makes a country song a country song and especially what makes a uk country artist a uk country artist this is a phenomenal talk his 2014 debut ep watch the darkness stumble home is great all his music is out on spotify go support him on bandcamp make sure you follow all his pages but let's get into this without further ado this is episode 61 of the rogue country podcast with mike west and my crooked teeth man obviously you sent over uh, the new single you're gonna break my heart which came out was it last week it came out yeah yeah last friday so well yeah, yeah so just just over a week ago now yeah awesome but before we get into that i want to take it right back to your origin stories and stuff mm, okay. when was it you kind of picked up a guitar or even when did you first really become aware of music and what were you listening to when it kind so, of clicked yeah i mean like i guess pretty a typical story um growing up it was very much a case of like you know my dad's record collection and that was really where like the country thing started mm. as well and like, it wasn't always the coolest country <laughs> no. uh, although uh, stuff I've got loads and loads of love for 
the big Billy Ray Cyrus album, George Strait, Carlin Carter, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but my dad had amazing taste and uh, I would go and see him every weekend with my sister. And it was like, who would get to choose the cassette in the back of his car <laughs> sort of thing. So I guess that kind of gave us that like involvement. Yeah. And, you know, we were making decisions about what we liked and which were our favorite and things like that. So, um, yeah, that was that was really where I became aware of it. And just that the sound of that music was just mm. quite embedded from that really young age. And there was an artist in particular called Nick Lowe, um, mm. who is probably my favorite songwriter now to this day and his album the impossible bird um that was like a family favorite so it was all that was always there and then um but i was a drummer originally oh yeah 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 and um you know in in, in the in the kind of punk punk rock bands mm. that's pretty typical for like the millennial guys who <laughs> yeah. all grew up on like tony hawk's uh, pro skater and all that sort of stuff it's like kind of massive at that like yeah. that age for i think for a lot of us so did did all that kind of thing and then just um when I was at uni, I just wanted to be more involved in the writing side of it. And I uh, just felt a bit limited about my decision making in a band mm. behind the drums. Uh, but I, I, playing drums kind of allows you to get a really good sense of like structure. Yeah. And you, you know, because so often you're playing the same thing for so much of the song, you can hear where like, well, that really should have, something should have come in there or like, yeah. we, should have hit, we should have hit another chorus at that point or something. So I kind of got that perspective and I thought maybe I could, I sort of felt like I had a good sense for that kind of thing. And then, yeah, I just picked up the guitar. And for, for ages, I was very, very much on the, you know, the first 11 chords that everybody <laughs> learns and then just Wait, got everyone. There's 11 chords? Yeah, Shit. Yeah, I exactly, yeah no, yeah. The, the, the seven, trust me, they even go <laughs> further than that. Yeah, and I was as surprised as you. So like, you know, and you can get quite far, like songwriting, can't you, with those things? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I did that for ages and then um, had, had a band that we kind of, um, you know, gave a bit more of a real go mm. um, coming out of the uni through the 20s and that sort of thing. Um, and then that kind of quietened down once uh, like our bassist was Italian, he was moving back to Italy mm. and then I started a family. So a really kind of typical story. And um, Michael Cateef was a chance to take all the songs that were a bit too quiet for them. Yeah. For that, we were a bit, bit of a noisier band. And um, and it was great because I always knew that I wanted to try and do something at least country-ish. Yeah. And very the folky and all that sort of mm. thing. And then you know now I'm 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 in my mid thirties and it's just been it's just been a great sort of expression of that that side of stuff. And um, now it's starting to creep, possibly getting a bit closer to the kind of stuff I was making when I was 24 with my. Mm. with like things i'm working on now but in the years in between it's been a bit nice chance to do something on that the quieter end of of that sort of thing and focus on the country and that sort of thing yeah no that's awesome so it was more like the 80s 90s like wave of country that really got you back in the day that's awesome yeah yeah that that very much that big i mean i guess it's stuff that my dad knew would like resonate with his kids in the back sort of thing it's like big big choruses big (laughs) like that just that great country sound that like i don't know i think it's i think people sort of look upon it quite favorably now mm. i imagine my I, I don't really know i wouldn't have had the perspective at the time but i imagine at the time people really into their country music probably felt it was a bit dirty it was a bit you know overproduced yeah. a bit too poppy but then watching where things have gone with the genre it's kind of like i think it's really it's seen as like almost like a bit of a golden age of yeah. its own isn't it yeah. like no, um, if, if there's one thing i've learned about country fans is they're never fucking happy nah. with what country they're like star wars fans in a way yeah, yeah. they're never happy with what they've got it's always right. well 20 fucking, years ago was the best the prequels were better and yeah it's like, yeah that's it yeah and then you've got like joshua headley um you know making his like 90s throwback album i think yeah. american aquarium did a bunch of cup co- 90s yeah, the covers, bangers slappers and yeah twangers. yeah that's yeah. the one and it's like, yeah, this is like really, really good stuff. Like, and I remember like, I remember being at school and somebody singing Achy Breaky Heart <laughs> and me being like, oh yeah, Billy Ray Cyrus off the Some Gave It All album. <laughs> and he was like, bloody hell, like you're not meant to actually like know who that is. <laughs> it's like, it's meant to just a kind of a joke song. And I was there like, oh, I listen to that every Friday. <laughs> like, I just thought it was really good. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Cause I remember 
coming up in the 90s being a kid and that uh, achy breaky hawk was fucking massive yeah i, think I remember yeah. it was like played at like every kind of family function it was played at every like disco wedding and stuff like yeah, that. It was yeah yeah huge. like it's it's you know it's not an understatement to say how big those artists were back in the day yeah. it's interesting to see it come back now and then how everyone kind of borrows from different ears and they're always saying like how the modern stuff sucks Mm. you know people 30 years ago were going to be saying the modern stuff sucks it's really yeah just, oh definitely people yeah. just aren't ever happy and it's it's great now like um oh just as i need his name it's going to escape me i think it's called jesse daniel um yeah. uh yeah I'm, I'm sure you're familiar like i feel like he's somebody who has lifted some of the really really nice aspects of that 90s country like it's really polished production everything sounds really bright mm. and clean but like his songwriting and like the, the telecaster playing is kind of straight out of like the sixties yeah. stuff and like the honky tonk, like um, Emily Harris type type thing. Yeah. And it's like, well, this is great. Like he's sort of managed to find a way to, he, he, the, the, the vocals are so clean. The harmonies mm. are so strong. It sounds just like a, like a, a Billy Ray album to me, mm. but like the songwriting is a bit more kind of like a, kind of a bit more refined and a bit yeah. cooler i think yeah and now it's all just it's all just there isn't it they like people like you say they can dip and dip into any any part of the history and take the bits that kind of work for them so yeah yeah so i don't know maybe maybe people will look favorably on the modern stuff in time but yeah maybe when we're like, when yeah. we're 50 someone will be like florida george line had some yeah. good points <laughs> and it's like <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's inevitable in a weird way isn't it yeah yeah but you like obviously with jesse daniel josh Radley and stuff you obviously still have a love for country and like the modern stuff is there anyone you kind of listen to now at the moment that you're really digging yeah um I, probably an obvious shout but tyler childers for me is um i just again it kind of a similar thing although i think he he does lean like into the old old school a, a little bit heavier than someone like jesse daniel but like just great sounding like kind of natural feeling albums yeah. that you know they're not it's not trying to be a throwback but he just has great songs the american um not american uh country squire mm. album that that's absolute top top five you know at least top 10 country albums for me mm. maybe even like albums really and um yeah i think and and he's he's kind of become a bit of an obvious shout but i think with probably quite good reason really yeah great songwriting like if you can get into his vocals it's like not for everyone um mm. but like if you if you if you're into it then like he he it's so distinct isn't all his own isn't it like yeah his style yeah so i think he he comes to mind right now definitely mm. No, awesome. It's interesting because, like, obviously, with Rogue, we try and promote artists and things, and we mm. pull up like videos of like five artists you need to listen to, and we've purposely not put Tyler Childers, right? And right. we've not put like because obviously Zach Bryan's massive, and we haven't put him, mm. and we we occasionally we don't really push Call to Wall as much because I I always kind of I don't know if it's because I'm so close to it. They're like in my head, they're already huge. They're already like oh yeah, like I red think, rocks yeah. and stuff. But it's oh, really God, yeah. interesting how like people kind of have that perspective that they are still underground and i think mm. that still helps push their kind of message and audience yeah. fan base to, as the underdogs everyone in country music or any genre really wants that underdog to kind of champion yeah i think i think you're absolutely right man like they they obviously like in kind of to people who really like the, the music and the sound they're they're truly like really established but it's funny isn't it like british audiences like from our kind of perspective as two guys in this mm. country who really like that kind of music it's so american centric yeah. like in terms of the, the big the real big names that they can play like god they're on their biggest days they've probably played like madison square garden or something yeah. or like something massive on for like a big event or something and then um you know you i mean i wonder how many people you'd need to walk around uh god not where i live it's i'm pro probably the only one who listens to them sort of <laughs> thing like and and i imagine when they um, come here i know they're sort of at that that mid-size like now but the feeling is that it's still very underground isn't it yeah. like um but then obviously like in texas they probably play like yeah venues the size of the desert sort of thing. yeah that's so the crazy thing and i kind of we're at a disadvantage booking american artists mm. and have an american artist come over because you have bands like Mike and the Moon Pies. Yeah. They're yeah, fucking yeah. selling out venues across America. 
and I'm playing with them in April, and they're playing Manchester at like a bar. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's like mad. they're they're playing the Bullingdon. You know, that's yeah. like um, with Ags actually. Yeah, yeah. You're, um, who you've you've had on? Who I, is is? Uh, well, I say he's a friend of mine. We you know we've probably hung out like ten times or something. Mm. But I I is a bit a bit of a local hero for me, um, which I think he's well aware of. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he's he's playing for them, and yeah, like same deal. It's like the Bullingdon, which you know. I've played 50 times. It's not like a, a big esteemed venue. They get great stuff in all the, all mm. the time. But like you say, they're in their own country, it's they're probably playing yeah. places almost like 10 times as big. Yeah. yeah, literally. yeah. So it's it's both a good thing as a fan. Yeah. I, I remember I saw Tyler Chills in like an 80 capacity venue. Amazing. A few yeah, years yeah. ago. And then you see him like, he's had, doing like two sold out shows in London. Yeah, in February yeah, yeah. or whenever it is. I know it sold out because I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely gutted. Yeah, and Tommy Tommy Prime's opening for him as well, and he's oh, gonna wow. be one that's gonna I think is slipping under the radar at the moment. And again, in the UK, we're kind of you know you're getting to see an artist in a venue mm. that you wouldn't get. Like that's kind of like the ten years ahead of that in America now. Yeah. It's like they wouldn't yeah, be yeah. playing that size venue anymore over there. And it's we're in an interesting point where you can see the traction happening. Like when Tyler came back, I was yeah. playing 2000 capacity venues, like on the next tour, it's like, you know, something's happening. Yeah. It's yeah. just trying to get that audience to pay attention to what's at home as well as the interesting thing. Yeah. I think, I think, I don't know, like I, I, I can sort of speak on this with like any real authority, but like, I feel like country music in Britain has like had a much bigger spotlight on it for for a few like strange reasons I, I hard to say exactly why but um yeah like I don't imagine the same kind of artists at the same point in their career would be playing the 2000 um seater venues yeah in in the U, even you know in in the UK 10 years ago I think he would have been in those kind of 400 yeah clubs, even with the Amer- uh, career that he has back in back in America mm. um definitely feels like there's been a bit of a spotlight on things but um but then you know that tends to be like i'll get in a conversation about something like that and i'm never want to never want to like gatekeep or tell somebody they're listening to the wrong stuff or anything but you know they'll say oh yeah it's like kind of like the shires or something mm-hmm. like that isn't it? it's like really kind of has a very kind of pop centric yeah. side to it and, and i have absolutely nothing against any of that but um i think the fact that tyler can come in over and be playing to two thousand people is, is probably like a pretty good sign, really. I think yeah. it would have been quite different 50, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. As I say, that's only my my perspective. Yeah. I, I can't really say on any authority, but yeah, it feels like it's been in better shape than it has been. Definitely. Yeah. No, definitely. And I think because even like Western AF and Gems on VHS have really kind of set up yeah. like an audience over here as well. Like, yeah, whenever yeah, I've definitely. been to gigs or played gigs or flyed gigs, people have been like, oh, I've seen so and so over on the gems youtube and it, the age of the internet has really helped push these artists into places of the world they wouldn't normally get to yeah yeah it's amazing for that definitely yeah western af i mean that's that's just like a dream channel for me like yeah. <laughs> put it is you kind of have that has that thing doesn't it where you just put it on just because they've put it together yeah. and you're like well this is probably going to be great so yeah it has that sort of market quality doesn't it yeah mm. definitely helps take it over over the borders i think doesn't it yeah that's the thing i think it's just what the UK doesn't really have is a kind of like an organization that people have that much trust in yeah. like that. Yeah. I yeah. think that's, you know, like um, Bear over the depression sessions is one of those guys who's pushing for those. And it's, you just kind of like waiting for it to break, but you know, gems had Benjamin Todd and Western AF mm. had Coulter and you need that type of name to just push yeah. it into the next level. And it's really interesting thing when you finally see it tip and yeah, I, yeah it is basically i feel like the uk is just at this tipping point for country and roots music and it's a really interesting time mm. to be around yeah definitely we're really lucky in oxford we have um chap called uh mike who uh does empty room promotions yeah. and he's so he's he put uh i've only played one show in the last three years mostly because of covid mm. um and then having a having another second baby but um yeah like quite a time for the whole world over but that was with Vandaliers, who were like great. Yeah. They were they were great old time. Um, wild wild boys. <laughs> um, I'll say that much. And he, um, my me and my dad went to go and see Courtney Marie Andrews. 
and that with and that was him again and he's doing Mike and the Moon Pies I'm sure you've got your equivalent probably where, where you are of those guys who and, and I just think thank God for him because uh yeah. it's probably like the, the last seven like country gigs that I've been to I've been lucky to see them just down the road for me mm-hmm. and it's like this one promoter and so that makes me feel like it's I'm really involved in it if he stopped tomorrow like that that is yeah. I don't. I don't think there's anyone else to be picking up the slack. Yeah. So um. Yeah. It's uh. It's it's there, but like we don't. It doesn't really feel like we've got the foundations in the same way, no. does it? Like no. Not only yet. thanks to probably ten, twenty really important people that we get them over in the way that we do. And yeah. 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 Because that's the thing. Like, because my equivalent's basically me. I have right. To, right. Yeah. I have to book everyone. That really? I kind of want to see over. That's how like the Sierra Farrell show happened. It was just like amazing. You know what's the? I heard from I think it was Chris Dover because he's got a venue in Bradford. Was talking about how he might be having her over, and he gave me the email, and we started kind of. Oh great! That way. But yeah. it is kind of at the moment with Rogue. It's just sending kind of hail mary emails to artists we like and their managers, and seeing if we can get them over, which is the interesting thing. But it is kind of like I've taken my influence from empty rooms, square roots, amazing, um, yeah, and those type of people that have been doing it for so long. Great, yeah, and yeah. There is like kind of that gap up north where we don't mm. have that them artists come. We have Manchester, but right, it's not as like frequent. Which is, you know, it's the UK again. It's just kind of London centric, of... isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's a shame. And like, and thank God you're doing that, man. That's like absolutely brilliant to to hear. Because like, yeah, like as I say, like if you know, I've, I can bank the last like five to ten great country gigs that I've been to on one one guy, <laughs> one promoter. Yeah. And as I say, like. You think, yeah, if that if and when that stops, like, well, mm. that's that's all of that just dried up, you know. Yeah. So it's so important. It really does come down to like sort of a few key individuals in a way. Mm. But that Sierra show must must have been amazing to get that book in. To have it kind of locked in mm. was insane anyway. But it was kind <laughs> of one of those things where it's like it was kind of like when Tyler first came over and you're like, how many people like obviously they've got a huge online presence. How many people are actually going to give a fuck and buy yeah, tickets yeah. and come down? And um, the first like venue we were meant to have it was a hundred capacity venue, right? Just okay, in the bottom of a pub <laughs> that I've got kind of a deal with. Yeah, yeah. That, that sold out in less than twenty four hours. So I was right. like, oh shit! So people are coming. <laughs> people are coming, and then yeah. because of the demand, they moved the dates and moved to bigger venues and because i had them booked in they were like if you've got a bigger venue we'll stick with you luckily i managed to get one again 300 tickets sold out and that show was just unreal for yeah, like, I bet it was, yeah. to see people coming from across the north because there wasn't any there was ireland and then there was nowhere else in the north right yeah, yeah. from scotland so it was we had the entire north of england coming to this gig and Wales amazing yeah yeah Oh man, yeah, fantastic! What what a great booking, yeah. yeah. Well, it's those type of things, but then it is the point that you want to get a UK artist on the bill as well, and that's yeah. where it's awesome to see you playing with like Vandaliers and stuff, and Ags is playing with Mike and Moon Pies. Where it's yeah, it's just as important to have a UK artist supporting them as it is to bring the American artist over. I think that's the important thing that a lot of national promoters aren't paying attention to. Mm. Is, yeah, yeah the nurturing that homegrown talent because a national promoter doesn't really look at the local scene or no, like, no. they'll just see if they can get an American artist over as well mm. and if they're going to bring someone because I remember Sierra was meant to come over with Arlo McKinley oh cool <laughs> and that was absolutely incredible I was like oh fuck and yeah, then yeah. when they moved dates he couldn't do it and I got mm. back on sending a like an Andy yeah. Dufresne an email a week just can I get a UK artist can I get a UK artist can I get a UK artist yeah. and to see folks like yourself starting to support these guys mm. it's been such it's what needs to happen because I've got um Ashley Harden who lives down in Cornwall found a load of Opry magazines from the 60s on eBay oh wow and um Incredible. he got me onto them so I bought a load of them and you see back in the day in the 60s man like Phil Brady and the ranch is like a Liverpool band we're opening for Buck Owens and Willie Nelson. <laughs> Amazing. And it's like the history is there of UK artists yeah, yeah. opening for these guys. But then it kind of dried up and they started bringing their own people over, which is, you know, if they're friends and they know what they're going to do, it is what it is. Yeah, but yeah. You should still have that kind of nurtured, homegrown talent on those shows to just try and give them a boost and, you know, hopefully. 
do yeah. something. Yeah, absolutely, man. And of course, it's yeah, it, 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 one thing nurtures the other, doesn't it? Then mm. you know, then that person becomes a stronger, a stronger support act the next time you've got yeah. someone in. You know, there's someone else, someone that came to see so and so saw the support last time and quite liked it, and so then they go and see them again, and it, yeah. it kind of all and eventually back become itself. a headliner in their own right. Like there's yeah. no, from everything I've listened to you, there's no reason you shouldn't be headlining <laughs> venues and stuff because your songs are that strong. You have that great sound. Well, thanks, man. That's very, very sweet of you to say. I think, I, yeah, it's a funny one. Like, I mean, that's that's very, very kind. <laughs> I'm probably a bit directionless. Like, I think it's always been a bit like, oh, this is just a thing I do, and like, it's I would find like I've I've had a bunch of songs on a back burner, and then the one, the most recent one that you've you've picked up and and been really sort of sweet to shine a bit of a light on. Like that was the most recent one. I've probably mm. got like seven. I'm sure you've <laughs> been guilty of this as well. I think we probably all are. But like, you know, I've got a bunch of recordings in various states of completion <laughs> that go back like five or six years. And then somehow this one's jumped the queue. And I think, well, that's great. But like, <laughs> why didn't I just get the other one like, out the door sort of thing? Yeah. And um, uh, so I, I, can't, I can be a bit rudderless for that sort of thing. So I'm probably like my own worst enemy in that sense. But I'm really lucky in that I've been in Oxford for so long that I kind of have like quite a lot of goodwill built mm. up locally. And that it's probably, I feel a bit less so um, since COVID, but again, I think that's kind of a universal feeling yeah. for a lot of people. Like I feel a bit more separate from things that are going on, but from my old band days, you know, we're very much like one of the local bands that people might go and see sort of mm. thing. So I've, I had loads of friends and contacts and that sort of thing. So I think that, that helps me um, a bit, even, even now, all these years later. Um, but yeah, as, as you know, so in, in, as, in as much as your very kind words, like I feel a bit more in a space to be able to focus on that now that, you know, yeah. I paused the, the, the first band to have a family and we've now got two, two of the boys and, even the younger one is starting to just get that little bit older. And I think, yeah, okay. I can probably commit a bit more time to this now and be a bit more organized with it. And I'm absolutely certain I'm going to get much more out this year than I would have done. So yeah, I mean, it'd be lovely to have things pick up steam, but mm. as, as you know, I literally be the last person I need to tell, like you, you just don't know, do you? Like, no. you know, some, you play one gig and it's like, well, bloody hell, that was, that was 140 people. And I'm, 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 I must be a musical genius because just look at all these people. And then the next thing you play, it's seven people and the dog, isn't it? And yeah, no, totally. Take them back down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never sort of, and, and I think removing that pressure is sort of probably made things a bit more fun as well. Um, yeah. Uh, but for, for all that now that COVID is hopefully really behind us as, as much as it can be, uh, yeah, I really do want to immerse myself in, in the gigs and yeah. uh, the, the the circuit and the scene and, and all the new faces that are knocking about much more than I think I would have done over the last five years. Yeah. So I'm hoping that will allow me to build up a bit of momentum, but yeah, who, who can say how these things are going to go, you know? Yeah. No, it's just a lot of grinding out and hoping you yeah. get the right things. What I always felt with kind of down your way in Oxford and stuff, obviously mm. like with Ags being there and stuff, it does seem an empty room promotions it does seem like it has that level of a scene kind of happening like sheffield where it's got those kind of things yeah in motion it's funny in oxford it's always been like americana like for whatever reason and when i was in like my americana band this would come up we were like what is it about oxford like why americana and i i don't think there's any like real straight up reason but we had like the dreaming spires they were sort of quite uh they they did some and and they had ties to like alt country yeah. of like the, the the late nineties I think and like had sort of a bit of a bit of sort of history to them and um, there was just loads and loads of bands who you know lent into that stuff yeah um, and and dipped into it but then in the same way that they were like rock and roll and yeah. you know like uh, indie and that sort of thing rather than like the pure country thing but Ags is definitely I think our shining light yeah. and I, you can. I've got a load of friends and musicians who like love country music as much as I do. And, you know, we'll all, we all say like, he kind of gave us the confidence to be like, I could, I want to try and make something that sounds really pure in yeah. that way that he, he has done. I think it, it was weird. I think he just kind of like validated it for people. Like you yeah. can make this and it can sound 
like you know you don't you're not putting on you're not putting yeah. on a a, a a shirt for it like it's real for you kind of thing yeah no and, it was uh, like for me it was the one of the first like i don't like to use the word authentic but honest mm. english country records that i'd heard yeah in a long long time and it was really cool to see that and it's also you know he's not you know huge in terms no. of massive venues and stuff he's still really down to earth playing you know relatively small venues and stuff so it feels accessible it feels tangible yeah he, he set the bar to a stand where you know if you're coming to put out a record and you want to call it country then you better be bringing something as honest as what <laughs> ags is yeah. bringing yeah, yeah i think i think you're absolutely right to say that it's funny to hear someone else sort of like talk about it because like yeah that's that's how that's the kind of space he's occupied in my mind for yeah. such a long time and um uh, yeah, it's just it's just funny like that, that it is he is perceived in that way by other people like yourself as well because uh, yeah it was like hearing it, it was like wow like this sounds so like real like you say doesn't yeah. it like it just instantly just made you know just you just harks back to that 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 sound mm. it's like how has he done this like <laughs> yeah. it's so much harder than it sounds isn't it like well mm. that's the it's the classic thing about country music everybody thinks it's so simple yeah and you know you think oh okay well it's three chords like I. I, I can play three chords like yeah <laughs> I'm sure I could write a country song and it's like it's actually like really 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 hard and I've like written like I've probably written like 100 country adjacent songs and then like maybe 10 country like country mm. country songs that like don't really dip into anything else and like for whatever reason they've ne- they've not sort of become part of my stuff that I've released um but that was like with with this one that's just come out you're gonna break my heart it was all it was like a challenge to myself mm. like everything i and I'm, I'm sure this is something that you're familiar with again like the temptation for me has always been like i definitely want to release songs that i can point to pretty much every lyric in it and say that may not be like autobiographical like to an absolute t but that's something i know and experience i'm yeah. not going to go and start singing about like the rodeo no. Or like <laughs> some a desert I've never been to, or like some mountain top or something. Yeah. Like I'm not. I would feel that's just not my personal own take on it, sort of thing. Yeah. Right? And so things tend to be like my own experiences and kind of done done in a way that just kind of feels natural to me. But this was very much like, well, I'm not going to sing about some bar in America that I've never been, but I am going to really, really, really try and nail the genre. Like yeah. I do what for as far as the genre feels, and like. This is put the only song of mine out that really doesn't actually relate to my my actual own feelings. Like I don't have this person. I'm in a I'm in a happy marriage. So yeah. like you know, it's not it's not like a something that I was drawing from a real experience, which is really out of the ordinary for me personally. Mm. Um, because I just wanted to see if I could just nail yeah. like that that the the the, the, the way that like each four line verse works. It's like, it's a really specific um, feeling and, and, and manner that they go to. And I was, it was kind of like a self sort of challenge really, because it's just so much harder than it sounds. Yeah. It, it Anyone who's tried to do it will tell you. It's not just writing a song. It's telling a story mm. from another person's perspective in less than three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Which it's yeah. a, that's, that's an insane thing to do if you asked you know a um you know an author to write a story with a beginning middle and end in three pages yeah yeah you know yeah. they're gonna struggle to get everything they want into it but there's you know songwriters and country musicians who can for them like if you if you look at what towns van zang accomplished him mm. and you and lefty in what, less than five minutes yeah 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 that's insane it's the ultimate sort of like economic st- yeah. songwriting, isn't it? Like everything. And there's no, like the intro will reflect something else that you've heard. The, like the refrain is borrowed from the same part. Like every, every part of the song harks back to something else. And then yeah. it's two minutes, 40 seconds long. And it's like, yeah, really, really uh, disciplined and completely focused. Mm. And then it's crazy. Cause like the guys that I was listening to really trying to get in the zone, one guy in particular, Charlie pride. Yeah. He's probably my, I guess he's probably my favorite light of the real, like golden age, 60s stuff. So it's good. Like, oh yeah. I mean, and his voice just like pure, pure honey, you know, mm. on the ears. Yeah. And, um, 
<laughs> it's like it makes me laugh like you go four years into his career and like then the song the songs that I was really enjoying are just off an album called Charlie Pride's 10th album <laughs> and it's like <laughs> bloody hell man like they just didn't stop you know no. they just they and they they would write the song like that and smash it out I imagine in no time at all because they were all like elite players and then just go and do another one yeah. and then four or five months later he would do another 10 songs like and yeah it's just so efficient so and I guess that was that was the industry at the time wasn't it like yeah. they, we talk about disposable music now but mm. those guys then you know I mean, yeah. obviously everyone knows about the Beatles like the amount of albums in seven years and yeah really like country before the rock and rolls um took over in in Britain as well as America yeah like Buck Owens it was like god no they were just putting out vinyls every yeah. other week yeah and I, then, didn't re- I didn't realize this it was Dolly Parton's birthday the other day and I was looking through mm-hmm her albums and stuff and jolene wasn't until like her 13th or 14th record so, yeah and and she did a bunch of that she a bunch of those she did with porter wagon yeah. i think she did 12 yeah and then she made it so happy. it's like like imagine that like most artists now like if they yeah. hit their 12th album it's like wow you've been around the block you know you, yeah. you've been in it for the long haul and she made 12 just with the guy before she had a career yeah. like it's just absolutely wild yeah so um they 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 were the ultimate sort of like economic efficient songwriting storyteller guys weren't they and mm. um it's it's a great it was a great challenge to sort of try and tap into a bit of that because it really is a lot harder than it sounds yeah and what was it kind of you said you had like country adjacent songs what mm. was it that you felt made them adjacent i guess cuz i really was li- good... i was mm. listening to your 2014 ep and a lot of that to me was mm. like stripped back country songs. If that had kind of come out. Yeah. You know, if you'd have come out with a face tattoo and like <laughs> scream and say in parts of them, you'd be on gems on VHS right now. Like, yeah. I, I feel like those songs, they have that bare bones raw mm. structure of country songs. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess those, those probably are really like um, roads on that was, yeah. was very much like the finger, the finger picking with the, the classic sort of like, uh, Johnny Cash style thing um no they they were and I think I think most of those probably hit that mark for, for me mm. I don't know why I think I think I always just put those in my mind as a bit more like folk but mm. that really only comes down to one of those things where somebody decides it's folk and somebody else decides it's country you know yeah. I guess I maybe was just a bit less comfortable putting the term on back then I mean worryingly that is like nine years ago now so it just <laughs> makes me feel slightly sick but um <laughs> uh yeah I guess in that point I felt uh just a bit more comfortable like using that term it's it's funny like to to go back to it and the fact that it is nine years ago and I look at listen to it now and I'm I'm really proud of it and I love the songs and occasionally like, I play them and they're the ones that like if I've, I've done a stream over COVID and stuff and if I put out a request for any requests they tend to come off that EP. So it's like, well, it's very sweet. I, I, you know, happy to sort of dip back into them. But you know how just time goes on. You just always, yeah. you just always want to look, you look to the next thing, don't you? And like, I, I just the fact that the EP is called Watch the Dark and a Stumble Home. I was like, what on earth is that about? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what kind of serious trip was I on at that at that <laughs> moment in time? And uh, but that's that's the beauty of it. It's that they they capture what I felt was yeah. really important at the time was that I wanted it to feel poetic and heartfelt and all that sort of thing and I think the next EP that I release I'm I'm pretty confident it's just going to be called pretty good because like that's (laughs) that's I just want people to get a sense of me a bit more as I am now which is a bit lighter about the whole thing yeah less conscious about being taken like really seriously and seen as like an (laughs) or you know oh my god what a heartfelt guy sort of thing so it's funny that you bring it up because uh yeah, I probably was more worried about being called country, but less worried about being seen as like a pretentious so and so. Whereas like now I'm kind of the other way around. Like, no, I really want to be a country singer with a sense of humour sort of thing. So yeah, yeah it's funny, just times, isn't it? You just get a bit older and uh yeah. I worry think about different things. It's it's a weird thing, man, because I think you know, I think Americana is called Americana because a lot of Americana is country music. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah people didn't want to market it 
as country. They were scared yeah. of having that label because country has so much connotations with yeah. so many different things that to brand it that can hinder it. While if you call something Americana, which is so loosely defined, yes, yeah, yeah, you can put I... whatever you want on it, and it's the same with folk. Really, it's so yeah. loosely defined as what it is. It's like world music. It's like, well, yes. what the fuck does that actually? Yeah, mean? yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you're, I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. Like, I, and I, I think if I think back to that time, that that prop, I'm sure that would have been a factor. Like, Americana is just something you can sell just that little bit easier I, yeah. I'm, by sell i mean sort of pitch to someone who's like oh this is the kind of music that i play um yeah it's like it's just a bit broader isn't it like somebody might think they can maybe it can invo- invoke something in them that probably feels a bit safer to their mind yeah. maybe than like when i'm a country singer like well bloody hell like that's <laughs> a, a strange thing to hear about so um yeah i think you're, you're probably absolutely right man mm. with kind of embracing that country Mm. title even and that sound what was when you were writing you're gonna break my heart was that initially just on an acoustic guitar as you normally would and then did you realize the arrangement later on when you were about to record it or what was the kind of growth of that song yeah i think it was very much it was written on the acoustic um but i knew i knew exactly what i was going for mm. and i think the only the only thing that i kind of regret was maybe not getting some lap steel on it or pedal steel <laughs> because that's just like the ultimate like yeah. icing on the cake uh, it did, just didn't didn't pan out this time but i knew that i wanted like the telecaster behind it and just you know the the, the roads keys and, and all the stuff that you kind mm. of expect and and the the drums to feel really kind of earthy and that sort of thing and that it was and i was never going to touch it with anything that was that was going to feel like left field and uh, because left field choices can be the very best thing in some songs but i just was like i really want this to feel like slightly kind of just of a moment and uh which uh, yeah so that that was a very it was baked in it really Mm. was like baked in like you know into the songwriting was like well this is where the telly solo is going to be this is where the piano solo is going to be and it was it was there from from the and you know i knew that i wasn't I wasn't going to throw in a, a middle eight with like an unusual change. It's like, it, <laughs> yeah. go, it goes where you feel like it's going to go. It, it like, and everything lasts for as long as you think it's going to last. And yeah. Yeah. the backing vocals remind you of the backing vocals. And like, it was, it was very much about that sort of like build with that in mind. Cause so often it's the other way around, isn't it? You've got one idea and then it goes along and then someone adds something and it's like, yeah. well, actually that really needs to go there. And this sort of all changes that let's redo the drums or whatever it happens to be. And that's that's brilliant. That's all part of a lovely collaborative music making process. Mm. But uh, no, this was like there was the, there was like the people that I sort of bounce ideas up and stuff. It was like there was no room for <laughs> uh, you know like I know no, no, I know what it is. And yeah, I think I've, I just happened to have it up here like um, two minutes forty six. Like that <laughs> that was like and that was kind of number between two minutes thirty five, two minute fifty. I knew at that tempo that structure is like it really should be that so it's like everything about it was kind of sort of part of the concept really Mm, so yeah and then um, and then it was just it was just the challenge of actually putting it together and um uh, it's the first one i've recorded myself Mm. um just sort of uh using my studio setup at home and yeah so it's sort of a bit of a kind of that personal challenge again it's just like can i can i do this and you know, b- between you and me and all your listeners, <laughs> like, I think I got like most of the way there. Like there's definitely, you know, you always listen to stuff and you kind of, oh, maybe, that, maybe that wasn't, didn't hit absolute mark that I'm going for, but I was obviously happy enough yeah. with where I got it. And you I kind of have to accept that sometimes. And actually that was what's so nice about what Josh said. Um, as I think he probably, he couldn't have known like that, that was, the nicest compliment that he could have possibly given was that you know he was like it sounds really nice like it yeah. sounds really kind of like old old school and and like kind of quite natural and organic because yeah. you know you're trying to almost recreate something you can't possibly yeah. tap into which is all the old gear and all the old the old atmosphere and, and recording style like there's no way i was ever going to be able to just go and do that so um that was that was probably the most encouraging thing that somebody has said about it actually. So uh, yeah, I was really, really appreciated him saying that. Mm. Um, 
so yeah it was all 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 built in and it was just the the, the challenge was actually really trying to achieve the specific sound rather than yeah. letting it evolve and that sort of thing so no that makes total sense with obviously like the tally and stuff is it you playing Italian things as well yeah so that was so as I say for the longest time I was on my my cowboy chords and mm. very happy <laughs> <laughs> and I always had the, my band and the guys and they was you know they were so good on guitar and it's like I just didn't have the need to yeah and then yeah again like probably such a universal thing but COVID happened and I was like I am gonna learn to play country music telecaster guitar and like you know, obviously, I'm 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 not like oh that's it achieved and I've <laughs> I've mastered it sort of thing. Like it's it's a lifetime's work, but you know I made more progress in that year of solid deep COVID that we were that we were mm-hmm. in than I had for the, like the last the previous eleven years on guitar. You know, that's awesome. Just... Where did you start with that type of stuff? Because I love that sound and I've kind of dreamt mm. of achieving that sound. I'm yeah, yeah. like one of the I guy come from heavy metal and my mm. electric guitar that i have with me is a dean flying v with a p90 <laughs> yes. humbuckers oh here we go yeah is yeah. isn't really the classic country sound <laughs> no so no, but it is a getting... classic sound though it's yeah, classic like, yeah. sound. so i've been thinking of getting a tally where did you kind of start in your like learning off that yeah, sound and that yeah. style man i had like so many like kind of full starts with it like i well, it helped initially that COVID had kicked off and like everybody will remember, you know, I'd gone from like commuting into the office every day to like, I was working just like kind of where I am now. And instead of having this eight to 10 hour gap where you're away from things, I just had it next to me. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's, that could be anything, couldn't it? It could be practicing to draw or whatever it yeah. was, but that definitely helps. It was like, send an email, pick it up and <laughs> just try and do this thing and had all the access to all this time for it that I had, didn't have before. So that definitely helped. And then I think the breakthrough I got was the, the, <laughs> the pentatonic scale, mm. which is like, I mean, it's like base, base level, yeah. but there'll be people listening to this like, oh my God, I learned that when I was like 11 years old, yeah. like, what's this going about sort of thing. But that's where it really unlocked. Like I tried Rocksmith. Did you ever hear of that? Yeah. It's like basically like a gamified version. And I kind of had some success and I spent way too much money on like all the Johnny Cash songs on it and things <laughs> like that. And you kind of like, you're learning it, but you're not really learning it in a way that you can like internalize. And yeah. Like if I went back to it now, I think I'd probably take more from it. Yeah. But from the position of absolute new be- beginner, it it probably wasn't quite right for me at least. And then I had a couple of books, and then I found um uh and I I'm slightly loath to say it because I think the YouTube channel thing is kind of a slightly cursed thing. Mm. I've, I've come to realise that people think you can sort of learn anything off YouTube, and of course it's incredible, but um. I found so many of the videos like really just more challenging than helpful. Yeah. There was one particular channel. So I'm, I'm very happy to give him a shout out. It's called anyone can play guitar. Mm. And he was all about like, you know, let's teach this, but then let's like understand everything behind it. Yeah. And he was very not obnoxious, very to the point and didn't do anything. He didn't talk about anything that he didn't need to. And that really unlocked it for me. Mm. So um, yeah, the pentatonic scale, man. It's the cage system. I, I'd yeah. heard about the cage system for years. I don't know if like that rings a bell in mm. like when you've done your, you know, looking around bits and pieces and stuff. But yeah, it was like, I, I, and I was like, I can't believe this is just there the whole time. <laughs> and I just like, I never like really had a way to apply it. So um, yeah, it was like a mixture of those two things. And then once you learn one thing, then when you go look at the book that yeah. felt like a foreign language two months ago, it's like, right, okay, I can understand that. And then when I'd go and play my, slightly silly like gamified version of it it's like oh okay now i'm understanding this bit a bit better and it will fit into each other but yeah get that man get those major the major pentatonic scale because because in your heavy metal yeah so it's all i'm guessing yeah is that is that all that's all standard is it Mm. and um but yeah everyone was like oh the the minor pentatonic is like what cool cool music sounds like but the country music is all built on the major Mm. so i was like okay (laughs) <laughs> That's what I've hooked onto that. Like I'm obsessed with this one thing now. <laughs> so uh, I just like kind of, yeah, d- dove into that. So it's probably like really basic to people that really do play guitar. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, that was, that was the kind of hook for me. Oh, that's awesome. I psyched myself out. I think as I went straight to 
watching like Don Rich videos with oh, yeah. like, Buck Owens and stuff. I was <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. fuck. I was like, oh yeah, they're, they're complete shredders, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, yeah, he's an absolute like, and well, of course, like bluegrass, you know, yeah, like yeah. say no more. It's like absolute lightning, isn't it? So, mm. um, yeah, there's uh, there's some really nice simple stuff out there, and I think you've had Charlie Marie on. Yeah. So yeah, she has a song called Countryside, yeah. which um. That was that was one of the very very first things I learned. Oh really? Little main cool. hook, yeah. yeah. That, and I, you know, and that kind of was like, oh my god, this sounds like a country lick, like, and it's really simple. And then you realise, like, that then the guy that I was watching, he had um, he did a Graham Parsons version of Streets of Baltimore, mm. which has a James Burton, like one of the one of the top country players. But again, it's like not that complicated. It's kind of not that complicated to learn, but really really hard to get sounding just right. Yeah. And then I had that little moment of like, that's in the same thing that the Charlie Marie thing is doing. And <laughs> I guess you, everyone has those moments, don't they? Where it's, you've been going completely blind for yeah. a few months and then suddenly something clicks and whether it's learning the, the first chords or, you know, whatever yeah. your hobby happens to be. So, yeah, um, but I, I, I absolutely love that song. And of course it helps if you're really happy to hear the music like again and again yeah. and again, no, which, yeah. Totally. Yeah, you need yeah. to be able to like suffer through those repeats like over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely love that song of hers. That's that's real. Like, no, that that EP in it album mm. that's just fucking incredible. I've not yeah. heard from her. Oh right, recently. I don't know what she's up to. I'll have to go do a deep dive and see what she's up to. Yeah, to yeah, no, she's button. fantastic, man. Yeah. And I and I I was so like impressed that you had spoken to her just because I thought. <laughs> She's like quite just seems like quite an interesting person as well. Yeah, so, did yeah. like did you listen to that episode? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like um, not what I expected, but so interesting and so mm. Yeah. Yeah, just a really Yeah, she's like quite an chapter. engaging person, isn't yeah. she? You just listen to her like, yeah, this she's got could probably just tell a few stories, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, with the guitar thing, like because I've always loved playing guitar. I very like the thing with when I practice is I've always got sidetracked, so I'll start playing something. Yeah. And then I'll play it wrong and go, ooh, mm. that that might be a song that... Yeah, and yeah. And I'll take that away and focus on that instead of doing the actual thing. But yeah, with... but, but that's a process in itself, though, isn't it? That's Yeah, it's, like, less disciplined, and, like, it's maybe not useful if you're really trying to learn that specific thing. But, you know, when you're coming at it from the position of, like, a songwriter, which, of course, you are you can't help it you yeah. just you hear that one like you get you play the the chord in the wrong place and it's like oh well, hang on that sounded <laughs> cool so maybe i don't need to learn all those shredding like licks because that's you know for you for someone like yourself like that's that's a mid late right there isn't mm. it you know you hear that yeah. one chord and your brain just goes to that spot of like well hang on i think i know what how that would work and and it's a different it's a different thing it's a blessing and a curse because yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're trying <laughs> to learn other stuff but um I think yeah you kind of you have you have to know that about yourself because i'm i'm really similar to you i would my old friends would teach me something and i'd pay attention for 15 minutes and then be like yeah but the thing you just showed me is i can write something with that and then yeah. <laughs> try and write a song and it's kind of annoying for them because i've gone off on my own tangent but uh it's just it's just applying it in a way that's right for you isn't it yeah. so yeah i can relate to you there man definitely yeah no totally it's so much fun though i do need to get a telecaster i think and stuff yeah and wrong. the mexican ones man they're great like um you know they're i'm not gonna they're not cheap cheap but mm. you can get one for hundreds yeah. as opposed to thousands so yeah. and um and there's absolutely nothing wrong with those man i reckon you'd have seen plenty of bands out with a they'd yeah. have had a mexican telly at least at least like in reserve you know yeah. do you know i think i was talking about this in um with chris dover and ashley hardening because they're just guitar virtuosos it's not fair how good they are <laughs> but um they found telecasters for like 90 quid oh, and they, no they bought one each i think i think chris bought one and i think someone else was looking at one and they sounded fucking phenomenal so i'm That's thinking i might even just get one of those i'll find the link and send it to you it's not you know fell off the back of a truck it's all above board i'm not <laughs> yeah right yeah. out this podcast by saying it's you know, a sweatshop <laughs> yeah. guitar or something this is it's yeah. just a cheap thing but they look, hey, man. They look the part yeah, yeah, and also like the the tellies always have a bit of a grungy, dirty, yeah. dirtiness to them anyway. So like, yeah, if it's got a bit of that going for it, it's no harm, yeah. no harm done. Yeah. I just don't know how to actually hold a non-pointy guitar anymore. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. Unless yeah, it's that's... an acoustic, everything else just has spikes, and I'm just like, this is how I have an electric guitar. But 
of a man, but everyone should, you know, own a flying V if they possibly can. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like it's like the Telecaster of like thrash, isn't it? Like, <laughs> it's just it's just inc- so like iconic. But I, I'd have the opposite problem when I've held them. I'm like, I don't know what is going on. Like, where's yeah. why why does it have two legs? And like, yeah. where do I put them? Well, like, that's the thing. Like, I've never liked sitting. I think I've played like five gigs where I've sat down. Right. Because right, I yeah. gr- I've grown up. I've had a flying V since I was like fourteen. Right, but that was always the guitar I played with, and you can't really play that. You can no. put it through, like over your name. Yeah, yeah, guitar. that's it. And then... It's just not fun. So I've, whenever I practice, even to this day with an acoustic guitar, I'm standing up, walking around the house playing. I very rarely sit down to do stuff right. because it annoys me. <laughs> I always yeah. cramp up in the back of my shoulder because I'm not used to just sitting with my elbow up that high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, but flying V's, you can't sit with a flying V. They're no. made to be walked around and like, yeah, yeah. doing your best mega death like um <laughs> impressions. Uh, that's see that's this, this the grass is always greener, man, because I'm like that, you know, like I love like I love Thrash, like Metallica, I think mm. are absolutely phenomenal. Love Megadeth, love love Slayer, all the all those all the, the big Thrash guys. And like, you know, there isn't a day where I'm like, Oh, I should just check it in and just try and learn. Like, I just, I just want to learn riffs. Like, I just yeah. want to learn riffs. Like, Hangar 18. Yeah. Like, just give me that. Just give me all of that. It's like, no, come on, you've chosen your path. <laughs> like... but that's. I always try and write riffs now in yeah. terms of like chord structures and stuff. I always kind of find that fun to do is to try and relay that mindset mm. into this type of music, which I always find fun because there are some really, really good riffs in country music. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Jeez, mm. like the, the Moe Haggard stuff. I mean, yeah. that's like become like iconic, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's see, see, that's something that's really alien to my brain. Like, I really find it that I like rhythms. I can, you know, like establish that a song is going to feel a certain way and punch at certain notes and yeah. and not on, on others. That I can get. But the, the idea of like having a counter melody and then mm. being able to somehow like come up with something on top of it completely. I don't think I, I don't think I could ever write a song that way. Mm. Like, and yeah, like you say, like the, the metal guys, that's, that's day one, isn't it? That's how a song starts is with yeah. something that is already so full of like detail mm. and its own melody. And then they find something on top of it. And I guess that's half the reason why so much of like old thrash is like guys shouting. And yeah, just yeah, to Metallica, try to get the I words think. out before yeah, yeah. they it's forget like, what place they're in. Because there's already there's already so much going on, isn't there? But um but yeah, I think if you can if you can apply that discipline, mm. yeah, that's uh, that's great stuff happens because that's hard, man, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And with obviously with you're gonna break my heart coming out mm. last week, you said you were working on new material, which is in yeah. the vein of country rock and old country and stuff. Mm. Is that kind of because you said you've got songs kind of recorded in different stages? Is that that? Or are you working on new things to bring out as well? Yeah, it's kind of like there's been these kind of seven and I'm I'm working on them all. And then I think I'm going to try and find the four uh, yeah. that just work and sound really and feel really, really nice together. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like there's something, some kind of feedback that I get is that I come across very one way recorded mm. and quite differently live. Mm. Uh, because and I and I'm sure this is something that you've probably experienced that yeah like for me like a live performance was always like about energy and yeah. you know engaging people and again like yeah I grew up in thrash bands and then like you know uh, even my old band which were sort of grungy country that sort of thing it was all about like the immediacy and yeah turning up and like trying to as best as possibly can like really blow people away and all the rest of it and I've never really left that mindset and then sometimes something that people told me is that like, you know, there's, there's it's quite, kind of two different me's really mm. the stuff that gets recorded, which is very much like put on a Sunday and having is very nice, like music, mm. um, but rarely like upbeat. And then people see me live and it's quite different and it is a bit more like that. And so I think, I just think, well, okay, now I want to get something that reflects the vibe yeah that awesome. i have live yeah so it's yeah a bit more songs with like, like those kind of mid tempos and then upbeat stuff so yeah it, it i i feel like i know which songs it's going to be and they're all going to have you know the a minimum 50 percent country flavor all the way to like straight <laughs> nice. up con- country rock um so it, it will it will always be in there and i'm too in love with the genre to possibly 
leave it aside. I think oh. it's just you put a pedal steel on something. It's like, well, that's better. <laughs> like it's better it than is. it was. Yeah. <laughs> like just for that being there, and it really doesn't matter if it's like indie or, or whatever. So it'll 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 be a factor in it uh, from start to finish, kind of different for each song. Um, and yeah, I just kind of want to bring out some of that energy. I think nice. that, um, now that yeah, now that I'm in a position to sort of, you know, now I'm not so tired. Like my kids are a bit older, you know. It made sense to write sleepy music when I was so sleepy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but now I've got a bit more free time and stuff. It's like yeah. no, I want to turn up places and yeah. and you know have something really cool and upbeat. Yeah. To play, so. And did playing with Vandaliers kind of strengthen your resolve in that way? Because obviously they're such an energetic yeah. band to see them yeah. kind of do that did that reinforce <laughs> your idea yeah it, you know what it's actually funny because like they're like such wild dudes and like they i think saw me as like the very sensible guy turned up and sung some like pretty songs before them and i think they came out and even made a comment like you know thanks jack for this music's but it was like but now we're gonna do something like way different kind of thing <laughs> he wasn't like being mean or anything yeah. he was just like I, I don't know if you've ever met the guy i think it's is it jake maybe no his name not, i've talked to them online and stuff but they, they are not come over this way yet they are in person as you see them online like they they <laughs> just like that and in straight away like to, for, you know when it said hello to them and i think they were already like quite a few beers deep and it's like <laughs> yep yeah, this is vandaliers like 100 percent and I did kind of feel like, oh man, like I kind of, I'm usually the loud guy, <laughs> and then like, and they had seen me as like the kind of like sensible, reserved <laughs> dude. And I thought, and I did, yeah. It's funny that you asked that because I was a bit like, yeah, I could go for a bit of that, like yeah. you know, turn up and make a bit of a racket sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do think it had been so long. I hadn't played a gig since Christmas 2019 before mm. the world turned on its head, and then. That was really just my oh my god! I just need to play something to some yeah. people, and and I'm lucky that it was such an awesome show. Um, uh, yeah, and in that time, things do things did feel so different. Like you know, yeah. I was in I was in a different place than I would what, what was at 2019, and and I'm so much more eager for that bit of noise now, and that you know <laughs> that energy that I guess is. It is created by having it taken away isn't it you know yeah no, totally not go to a gig for like 18 months or i, I used to play a gig every three to four weeks mm. uh, minimum for 10 15 years and then suddenly it's like wow i haven't done that for yeah. three years nearly two and a half years and then of course you want you want the loudest most energetic thing that you can possibly get can't you at that point mm. so yeah i i do think that that did help kind of facilitate that idea 100 percent no cool and you know we'll wrap this up now but do you mm. have any gigs kind of lined up for the rest of the year do you have anything coming up yeah uh, so I, I started putting all the feelers out and there things are sort of starting to starting to emerge i'm sure it'll be announced by the time this this comes out and feel free to chop and change anything that is is not no longer appropriate or whatever but um we have a festival over here in the 11th of feb uh beam me up so oh, this cool. whether or not this will be in the past by then or, or yeah, i or, think or... this will come out on the 6th so the week before okay. or the week of basically well amazing in that case yeah so 11th of feb um at the o2 academy we've got a festival called beam me up with um opus kink uh self-help i'm trying to think who else uh the people versus who i i'm sort of slightly familiar with a couple of those guys um and I think there's a Lincoln leg, leg of it as well, but the but the there's a but two separate bills. Mm. So 11th of Feb, yeah, and um, yeah, I'm going to be playing stuff that is new with a few of the old ones as well. Cool, and, you know, some some very nice, sensible songs, and then some slightly louder, balmier ones as well. And so, have you looked yeah. obviously with you're going to break my heart and stuff with the more instrumentation? Have you looked at putting a band or a duo or stuff? Sort of yeah, so. New shows? Yeah, and I used to, I did pre-COVID yeah. play with a bunch of guys, and we were, and that was one of the things is that everyone's like, there's so much more energy, and there's more, there's just more in what you're doing there than this fairly like stripped back song. So, yeah, and again, you know, that's that's kind of been, everyone's in a slightly different spot now. We've all just been through this collective shift, so it's yeah, it's happening, it's underway, but probably not for the eleventh. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I I think I just kind of got the itch for that. 
no, it makes the, sense. The proper kick of like drums yeah. behind it and stuff, and being being maybe a little bit noisier than it should be, and all that sort of stuff. That mm-hmm. all the old habits, you know, yeah. like I know this song should be quiet, but we're going to play it loud, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's time definitely. Yeah, right. On, and last question, just because mm. I can't believe we've spoken for an hour, and I've <laughs> not asked you what was at the top of my list was my crooked teeth. Where did that moniker and title come from to yeah. perform that project? Um, so I think it, I'm pretty sure it's a misheard Death Cab for Cutie lyric mm. from the song Crooked Teeth. And Benjamin Gibbard, uh, I think is a phenomenal songwriter and I love, I love Death Cab. And funnily enough, I mean, he's made some really great country stuff as well. He's mm. got a solo album, um, with some really, really good country songs on it. And he's sort of dipped in and out of it through various projects. Jay Farrar, he made one, uh, and made a really, really good album with him. Uh, and I do have a couple of really crooked teeth, <laughs> so it's like it seemed like, well, that's that's um, uh, that's like, like a natural fit. And I think just being called Jack Olhavsky, it's like, yeah, I ask people to learn that and get it right and things. And my crooked teeth is three very simple words. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that that makes sense, man. That's awesome. But thank you so much for talking to me today, man. Mate, I really appreciate it. Oh, Mike, honestly, thank you so, so much. And just to say, and, and if, whether or not you'll, you'll put it in, it's not, it's totally up to you, but I've so much respect for what you, what you and the guys do, man. And, oh, um, so much. you know, uh, such a positive influence and impact on obviously music that we both really, really care about. And that just really comes across like, mm. um, in the things that you're involved with. And when I've messaged you and you've like, you know, you didn't, you didn't know me and you sent me back and sent me some really helpful stuff and you produce great, great content. And uh, I think it's really important, really healthy for the mm. for the the music that we obviously yeah really really love. So a massive thank you to you and Josh as well. That was mm. really sweet. Some of the things that he he'd said about the single. So yeah, uh, it's yeah. been a real pleasure. And thank you very much for uh, having me. No, thanks so much, man. I was texting Josh about you the other day because finding your music is what makes all this worthwhile. It was, mm. It's what keeps us going to hear you putting your heart and soul into this type of music in the UK is so it's a massive thank you to you man that's oh, great thanks man and then and maybe we'll have a chance to grab a beer one of these days oh, or something most most definitely i've already got <laughs> gears in my head to work on something oh fantastic lovely <laughs> And there we have it, folks. Go check out Mike Crooked Teeth over on Facebook and Twitter. I believe he doesn't have an Instagram. I might poke him into getting one because he needs to reach as many people as he can. Make sure you listen to him on Spotify. Make sure you follow him on Bandcamp. And make sure you listen to the brand new single, You're Gonna Break My Heart. It is fucking phenomenal. You will not regret listening to it. Thank you so much, Mike Crooked Teeth, for making the time. Thank you so much to our upcoming guest, Frank Turner. You heard it here first. He is going to be the next episode, and it was really nice to talk talk to him about songwriting and touring and punk music and playing the houses of parliament and tons of other things but make sure you check out american aquarium on tour make sure you check out john r miller and jp harris on tour and make sure you check out mike and the moon pies on tour and make sure you keep checking out uk country and roots artists because you will not be disappointed in what you find until next time folks keep supporting the things you love keep doing the things you love peace